Okay, here we are back from our break, and now we're going to uh, do the second part of tonight's lecture in week three. Um, the Hebrews, the God who did wrong, okay? Uh, and I'll explain to you my title about why I'm calling this lecture The God Who Did Wrong uh, in a few moments when we get to that. Okay, there was a question uh, at the break uh, 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 about Asher, the god of the uh, of the Assyrian uh, of the Assyrians, who imposed their god on everyone. Um, about whether he was a monotheistic god, and actually he was not. There, there's a goddess Ishtar, um, Inanna, who is a love goddess. There are gods of grain and medicine and agriculture. So Asher is not a monotheistic god. There are a lot of subsidiary gods, but that's an interesting question about whether he was or not. Um, there was also a comment by, by one of our students here about the, um, about the phenomenon of the vultures disappearing from Bombay. And uh, I had actually read that and had forgotten about it, that um, the problem was because the sacred cows in India, you know, the Hindus uh, hold their cows as sacred and they allow them to wander around the country. And, and they were giving these cows painkillers when they got old and feeble and, and sick. <laughs> and the painkillers were entering the food chain. I'm not sure whether the vultures were eating the dead cows or eating the droppings of the cows, but the, the painkillers were entering the, the meals of the vultures, and this was destroying their kidneys, and they were dropping out of the sky, and, and, um, and that's why all the vultures were dying and causing the problem in Bombay. So thanks for reminding me about that. It's really interesting how two religions can clash in that way, as you observed. Okay, uh, now we're going to turn to another set of nomads. Remember the Indo-Europeans were nomads who traveled from place to place. They herded their, their horses and their cows, and that meant they couldn't live in one place. They had to go from pasture to pasture. And they had a very different culture from the settled cultures in Egypt and Mesopotamia, in the, in the city cultures. The Hebrews are likewise a group of nomads who travel from one place to another, and they're shepherds who largely herd sheep, and that's how they start out. And so there are some interesting comparisons between the Hebrews and the Indo-Europeans. Um, there are comprehensive studies of the Indo-Europeans. A very good one is called In Search of the Indo-Europeans. It's by Mallory, and he determines that actually the Indo-Europeans originated in the Caucasus um, region that I, I showed you. Um, there's no comprehensive study of the Semites, unlike the Indo-Europeans. And the Hebrews are a Semitic people. But we've already run across some other Semitic peoples. Remember that the Akkadians and the Assyrians were Semitic people. So the Hebrews were one among many groups of Semitic peoples in the Middle East. They were pushed into the Egyptian world by the movement of the Indo-Europeans moving southward. And when we look at the Hebrews, we have to consider the historical context of them. Remember that the Hebrews did not emerge from, the vacu from a vacuum, but in the midst of civilization. They, they, um, this is their environment. Um, OK, uh, and let me go back to this last time. We looked at the first barbarian invasions with the horses and the smoked wheels and bronze. And we saw the advantages that these conferred. Bronze um, is, a hard, is a hard metal that you can use much more uh, profitably than stone or, um, or wood. Uh, the the uh, Indo-Europeans were shepherds, cattle herders, and horse breeders. They were lactose tolerant, and this, and this increased their survival. They created the environment in which the Hebrews appeared. Okay, the Hebrews did not appear in a vacuum. So consider the historical context of the Hebrews. Um, the Hebrews trace their ancestor to Abraham, and Abraham, and here's an Assyrian war chariot. Okay, um, and this is the environment that the Hebrews grew up in. The, the, they built their culture in this environment. 
Okay, Abraham was from Ur, a Sumerian city, and Abraham is regarded by the Hebrews as their most ancient ancestor who founded the Hebrew people. So where is Ur? It's in Sumeria. Okay, so Abraham was a Sumerian, and they, they trace their culture from him. With the Hebrews, with the, with the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, we considered the... Um, the environment, uh, the physical environment, like rivers and streams and, and, and um, uh, protection, deserts and, and uh, droughts and weather. With the Hebrews, we have to consider the human as well as the physical environment. So we have to look at the human environment. Our main source for the Hebrews is the Bible. Uh, the Hebrews were affected by those around them. Our main source is the Bible. And the Bible is two things. First, it's a religious document. It outlines the religion of the Hebrews. But second, it's a history. It tells the history of the Hebrews, but also the history of the creation of the world. And so it incorporates some of the religious uh, concepts we saw in, in the other cultures. But it's a history of a people. So it's it's different from the religious books that we, we've already encountered. It was written down from 1000 to 400 BC. Nobody sat down and wrote out the entire Bible, but it was written bit by bit and it was revised time and again. So it was written and rewritten and, and pieces of it were written in other places and then it was pasted together at various times, much revised and there are layers and layers of stories, okay? Also, we can look at archaeology in the, in the Holy Land, in the area where the Hebrews lived, and we can, we can then um, either confirm much in the Bible or see how things happen differently than the Bible actually tells us from the physical locations, which largely can be found. The, the, the physical locations that are described in the Bible can often uh, be found uh, in the Holy Land. Well, how do historians treat religion? How do we treat religion? The Hebrew religion is a religion of a lot of American cultures. Uh, it's a basis for Christianity. How do we treat it? We treat it with objectivity, okay? We, we try to look at it in the most objective way possible and describe the Hebrew religion in the same kinds of terms and with the same kinds of criteria that we look at Egypt and Mesopotamia and the Indo-European religions. We try to treat it with complete objectivity. Okay. And here we see a map. Here is the, uh, a great drama in human history it took place on a very small stage. Here we see the Holy Land as it was, as it is on our world map. And here we see a close-up. Here's the city of Ur, which is in the very south of Mesopotamia. We've seen this map before with the Tigris-Euphrates Valley. And here is um, uh, more of a close-up of the Holy Land where the story of the Hebrews was worked out. And here we can see the orange area where we have the kingdom of Israel and Judea in that region. And to the right of that in the circle is the region of Ur. Abraham in Ur. So the Hebrews, according to their own story, traveled from the Sumerian culture and into the Holy Land. The Hebrews were nomads like the Indo-Europeans. They were peasant shepherds and they herded sheep for their, for their, um, for their, their livelihood. Unlike the Indo-Europeans, they had no significant government. They never developed a, a government in the beginning in their nomadic life. They had no social classes. They were all equals. And this, this is something they shared in common with the Indo-Europeans. Remember that the warriors uh, among the Indo-Europeans, the assembly of warriors, were all equal. Well, this is true of the nomadic Hebrews as well. Like the Indo-Europeans, they had no literature except the Bible, and the Bible was only written down in 1000 BC, but the Hebrews were a thousand years earlier than that when they first appeared. When they first started out and entered into Egypt and into, into the region of the Holy Land, they had no buildings and no art at first. It, it, 
only briefly in 1000 BC did they build cities, but that was only for a very short time of their history. But they really excelled in developing abstract religious thought. This was their great achievement, thinking about God. Um, they developed ethical monotheism, and remember we said monotheism was one God, one God, and they, uh, they believed that man was created in God's image, and this is something new that we, we haven't seen before. The second great achievement might have been the invention of history, and this is, uh, this is an issue of some debate. You know, Frank Holt in, in our department here teaches Greek history, and he and I have discussed this, and he insists that the Greeks invented history, and so a, a lot of intellectuals in the Age of Enlightenment like to believe that the Greeks invented history. But the Bible is a book of history, and it far predates the Greek writing of history. So I think there's a valid argument to be made that the Hebrews invented history, and they were the first to write history. But it's a different kind of history than the Greeks wrote. Uh, we have in our reading tonight the Genesis creation story, the beginning of um, uh, the creation according to Genesis in the book. Well, the early Hebrews conceived of their God in terms of the environment, and they originally thought of their God as a sky God, and they still do. Where is God? He's in the sky. The sky spreads all over everybody, and so their God is that kind of a God, a sky God. Um, and uh, uh, this is interesting, the Indo-Europeans had a sky God as well, um, Zeus, uh, the uh, the thunder god is a sky god. But the early Hebrews conceived of their god in terms of the environment. And if you read the Genesis story of the creation, there are two stories of the creation. Okay. Um, there are two stories, two versions of the Genesis story. One is a rather non-sexist version, probably earliest, and which describes the creation of the world, the creation of the sky, the 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 air, the hills and the valleys, and the creation of, of humans, uh, male and female, created he them. It's a kind of an equal, equal kind of creation of males and females at the same time. Immediately following this account of Genesis, there is another account, a second account pasted on of a later version of the creation of human beings. And this is the story of Adam and Eve, and you, you're familiar with that story, that in the second version of the creation, Eve is created from Adam's rib. And this is uh, interpreted as making Eve inferior to Adam in some way, because Adam was created first, and then Eve was created from a part of Adam's body. So we've got two versions uh, which found their way into the Bible. And uh, which, one, which one did the Hebrews believe? Well, they kind of switch back and forth between the two and accept both as valid. Um, but this illustrates the way in which the Bible was written with many different versions pasted together, revised, and edited over time. Um, if, you, if you read uh, about uh, Yahweh, he is a battle god for wanderers. He is a sky god who spreads over all. He also can appear in the early part of the Bible as an animistic god. An animistic god is an object that is given divine characteristics, and we see him appearing to Abraham as a burning bush. And so this is an animistic um, manifestation of God. Um, he may have demanded human sacrifices. Uh, now, this is a little bit more difficult to interpret, but we have the story of Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham was ordered by God to sacrifice Isaac as a sacrifice to God, but in the, but just at the crucial moment when he was about, he was very obedient, he was going to obey God and sacrifice his son to God, God stopped his hand and said, do not sacrifice your son, and from now on, I want only animal sacrifices. So this, this could be interpreted in two ways. 
we can interpret it to say the Hebrews did practice human sacrifice at some point and then they ruled against it, uh, that, that they decided to stop, that God ordered them to stop, or we can say there's a rule against human sacrifice in the Hebrew religion. And, and so it depends on, it depends on how you interpret that, that passage. Uh, so God may have demanded human sacrifices, but we have a clear statement that human sacrifices are forbidden by God. Um, so this is an example of the way in which Yahweh changes through time. Um, uh, and, uh, or we can say the concept of God among the Hebrews changes. The formative experience of the Hebrews took place under Moses around 1200 BC. And this is the time when the Hebrews, or one group of the Hebrews, was in Egypt. The Habiru were captive in Egypt. And Moses is said to have been favored by the Pharaoh and to have led the Hebrews out of Egypt. Okay. And this is the formative experience. Moses was given the Ten Commandments, and he was said to apply them as a law to all the Hebrews. Okay, uh, what kind of laws are the Ten Commandments? Can anybody sort of explain what kind of laws they are? How are they different from, for example, Hammurabi's Code? They're very moralistic. For instance, do not kill why they focus on human emotions rather than uh, concrete distinctions yes okay they they focus on human emotions and how else are they different from Hammurabi's code last week we looked at Hammurabi's code and we had things like an eye for an eye there was punishment yeah they're not specific I mean they apply to everyone it's very broad okay they're very broad they're not specific instead of saying if you, if, you, if, if you build a building and it collapses and kills the, inhab the, the owner's son, then your son is going to be killed. Okay. Uh, there's, there are no punishments in the Ten Commandments, are there? there? There's no punishment. It simply says, it doesn't say you shall not build a building that collapses and kills the owner's son. It says thou shalt not kill. Okay, they're extremely broad and general with a long, a wide application, a widespread application. Uh, and there are no punishments in the Ten Commandments. What else do you, what, how else are they different from Hammurabi's Code? Anybody think of how they're different from Hammurabi's Code? Yeah. Hammurabi's code, wasn't that publicly displayed while the Ten Commandments were placed in the holy spot for the Hebrews? Yeah, but the, uh, and that's an interesting point that the, uh, the Hammurabi's code was publicly displayed in a stella that was, that was very big in the public square so that everybody could go and read them. And you had to go read them because there were so many of them. Uh, if you say Ten Commandments, there are only ten. There are hundreds of Hammurabi's codes, and they deal with very specific instances and very specific crimes and very specific punishments for different classes of people. And the Ten Commandments apply to everybody. There's no distinction of class. There's no distinction of slaves and free. I mean, well, the Hebrews didn't have slaves, and so it, it's an egalitarian society. Um, and so that's another thing that's... that's uh, um, uh, different between the two. Uh, what do you make of the fact that there are only ten commandments? What do you think about that? I mean, there's something magical about the figure, the, the number ten, it's important. Yeah? I mean, the whole book of Genesis follows a mathematical structure, for instance, 70 and 12 and Isaac's son, so I suppose ten was a number, you know, even, and they were just using that you know, pattern. Okay, there are lots of numbers, and numbers have a lot of symbolism. This number is particularly important because we know that in the time of Moses, the Hebrews could not read and write. Okay, 
They were pre-literate. And so why is, why is 10 significant if they're pre-literate? Good, 10 fingers. Because there's 10 digits on your hands? <laughs> <laughs> they could have had 20 if they counted their toes too, but they only counted their fingers. And so this is a way to remember the 10 commandments. There are only 10 and you can have one commandment for each finger. So this shows they're a pre-literate society and we know they're a pre-literate society. Uh, there are no punishments if they simply forbid killing and adultery and stealing and lying and, and disrespecting your parents. And so, and so it just simply says, thou shalt not. Okay. Now, later, when the Hebrews learned to read and write, when they became civilized, I guess you want to say, and they lived in a city, then they could read and write. Then they wrote an elaborate law code. And this is Deuteronomy. It's one of the things you're reading right now. And if you read that reading in Deuteronomy, you will see that it's very much like Hammurabi's code. And it also practices an eye for an eye, and it has punishments. But before they could read, and, and this is important that they, that they develop the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments are far more lasting than Deuteronomy and the specific law code. We can still remember the Ten Commandments and it's still a generic guide for us. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. And, and so it's, um, it's a very useful religious device that helps them to make the step to, to monotheism. It helps them develop monotheism. Okay, when Moses, this is the formative instance when you, when you see the monotheism developing. When Moses leads the Hebrews, and there were other Hebrews, the Hebrews uh, in Egypt were not the only ones, but it was those Hebrews who developed monotheism. When Moses led the Hebrews out of Egypt, you now have a new concept of group identity because Moses, Moses unifies the Hebrews in the flight from Egypt. Um, God parts the Red Sea, and so they cross the Red Sea and escape from the Egyptians. The Red Sea comes back together and drowns all the Egyptians, so God is on their side. And then they start wandering in the, um, the Sinai Desert. Okay. Other Hebrews had stayed in Canaan and settled down and were still living there, but only these Hebrews were the ones that, that formed the monotheistic religion and became the, um, the progenitors of the Hebrew religion. Uh, this is an Egyptian depiction of the Hebrews, if you want to show us that, Don an Egyptian depiction of the Hebrews, and you can see them with their, their shepherds, with their, their goats and their donkeys, and they're these egalitarian type shepherds who are wandering around the area. And then they left Egypt and they were slaves, and, and they, uh, they had that same quality of egalitarian nomads. They were all equal to each other. Here you can see the orange. Uh, the lower part is the Sinai Desert, and then just above that is the area that they came to after they crossed the Sinai Desert, the Promised Land, the land of milk and honey where God was guiding them. Okay. Other Hebrews had stayed in Canaan, which is part of that area in the orange part, and had settled down, and they had formed cities and villages, and they adopted city gods. They had abandoned Yahweh. Here's the land of milk and honey, by the way. These are the ruins of the houses of ancient Jericho, and the Hebrews were were warriors. As, as they moved into that area, they conquered Jericho, and they had to conquer the Holy Land. I mean, God didn't just give them an empty land. He gave them a land full of people, and they had to fight in order to conquer it. And here is Jericho, one of the city they conquered. This is the land of milk and honey. What do you think about this? <laughs> Let's look at some, well, here, here are the Hebrews working as slaves in Egypt. They started out as slaves. Here is the promised land of milk and honey. What do you think about this? Would you like to live there? This is the wilderness of Judea. How would you describe it? Oops, well, we'll come back to it. We'll see some more in a minute. Very rugged and difficult to travel 
it's rugged and difficult to travel in, and it's barren, it's a desert, and there's nothing growing there. I mean, it's not a beautiful Garden of Eden place to live. It's, it's, it's a very harsh land and a very difficult land in the wilderness. Now, because of this wandering, they change their name. Now they're called Israel as they move into this area. And this name, Israel, distinguishes them from the other Hebrews who stayed behind in Canaan in the land of Judah. And so they're called different names. And here we see the map of Palestine. And if you see the, um, the kingdom of uh, Israel is the green part where the Israel settled. Uh, um, they, they aren't led by Moses anymore. When they left the Sinai Desert, uh, Moses had to stay behind because he had a lack of faith. And they were actually led by Aaron, his brother. And the green part is where they settled in the land of Israel. Below them is the land of Judah. The uh, yellow part in, in the land of Judah was inhabited by other Hebrews who had not been enslaved in Egypt, the ones in Israel were enslaved. Um, the Philistines are the purple part to the south. The Philistines, remember we encountered them before, they're half Greek and half natives who settled in that area. And to the north, the blue part are the Phoenicians or the Sea Peoples. And we think the, the, the Phoenicians were the Sea Peoples. But so here we have all these different peoples living in the Holy Land. And they all fought each other. I mean, the, the kingdom of Israel that, that was given to them by God was not a free gift. Uh, uh, they had to fight for it all the time. And we know they fought the Philistines particularly uh, as their enemies. So here's the map of Palestine. Here's the Dead Sea looking south. And again, it's a barren land, a harsh land, a difficult land to live in. The Dead Sea uh, is, is not very fertile and inviting. Okay. So they settled in the land of Israel and they built the Hebrew state around 1000 BC. Uh, the Hebrew state was uh, ruled by Kings David, Saul, and Solomon, and there were, there were some other kings, but these are the mo most important ones. They get the concept of kingship from Egypt and Mesopotamia because when they started out, they had no sense of government. Remember, they had no government. So they learned from the people around them, the environment around them, to have kings and to build cities and live in a city. They fought off their enemies. And remember the story of David and Goliath, David fighting the giant Philistine Goliath and slaying him with his slingshot. The Philistines were partly Indo-European, part Greek. One of the things that we have to note about the Hebrew state, the state of Israel, is that it was put together in the time when there was an interregnum in Egypt and Mesopotamia. It's one of the fallouts of the barbarian invasions, okay, that there was no there was no government or no, no pharaoh in Egypt at that time, around 1000 BC, or 1200 to 1000 BC. And there was, there, there was chaos in the Middle East because the Assyrians, uh, the Hittite Empire is, is persecuting the Assyrians after 1000. BC, the Assyrians and the Egyptians create empires, but before 1000 BC, there were no empires and most of the governments were broken down. Later, the Assyrians and the Egyptians create empire, then the Babylonians and then the Persians. Okay, so the Hebrew state only lasted for about 100 years and it's the result of weakness in the empires surrounding them. Okay. Now here we see the kingdom of Israel as it's pulled together. They actually conquer Judah. They, they impinge on the um, uh, Philistines to the south and they enlarge their kingdom. And this is the kingdom as it existed for only about 100 years. And they build cities and they live in cities for the first time. Okay, here's a letter of the Egyptian governor of Jerusalem telling of the invasion of Palestine by the Hebrews. This is the 14th century BC when the Hebrews are moving in there. There's an interregnum in Egypt and Mesopotamia around 1200 to 1000. Before 1200 BC, there's the Hittite 
empire, and after 1000 BC, the Assyrians and Egyptians create empires than the Babylonians and Persians. I'm sorry, I said 100 years. If a Hebrew free state was only 200 years. They developed a city culture. They settled down. They were no longer nomads and shepherds, but they lived in the city, and their lifestyle changed, and they became a city culture Okay, for the first time. And for the first time, they started building buildings, okay, the Temple of Jerusalem, and they have real city life, and now their name changes again. We call them Jews now because they're the people of Jerusalem and they live in Jerusalem. Okay, so let's take a look at the city they built and the culture they built when they build their kingdom. Here is the Assyrian Empire that conquers later, uh, the, later the Assyrians, uh, uh, I mean, no, this is earlier, the, wait, no, later the Assyrians. The Assyrians conquered before. There are Neo-Assyrians that conquer later in the 7th century BC, okay. And here's the Persian Empire that overwhelmed that region, okay, later. Here's the city of Jerusalem as they built it. This is a, uh, this is a um, drawing of it at a later time. But this is the temple in Jerusalem in the center and the city of Jerusalem. And here's another picture of Jerusalem on a hill with all the houses around it. They have city life. But Yahweh was a nomad god for shepherds. He was a sky god. He was a god for people who were equal and who were very primitive and who, and who tilled the fields. Here's the temple of Jerusalem. The Hebrews now felt the appeal of the city gods like Baal, the god, the god of, of um, uh, uh, gold, uh, the, the gold from money and trade and fertility gods. And so they felt the appeal of these other gods, but their god was a god of peasants, okay? The Hebrews were very conscious of this change in their society, that their society had changed drastically and their god had not. So why didn't they get rid of that god, okay? Why didn't they get rid of that god? Here's the tomb of David. King David? Okay. Okay. Why is he the God? Well, I, I don't know whether I wanted to say this here or the God he did wrong. The God who did wrong. Okay. The Hebrews felt the appeal of the city gods and the Philistine god Baal and the fertility gods. The Hebrews were conscious of this change within their society. And the consciousness is shown by the uh, rise of the prophets. From 1100 to 500 BC, the prophets arose in, um, in the, the Jewish kingdom. The prophets were spokesmen who called the people back to Yahweh to keep them from abandoning their gods. And you have some readings from the prophets. I think you have two readings from Isaiah in two of the different book. Okay, the prophets arising changed the assumption about the individual in society. Now, a prophet was any individual who has charisma, and the word charisma means being called by God. And it's the duty of a person who is called by God or Yahweh. That person has a moral imperative to speak out in the name of God. And so this emphasizes the rise of the individual. Any individual who has charisma has the moral imperative to speak out. For example, King David acknowledged the right of the prophet Nathan to criticize the king. So the prophets can criticize the king and criticize people in society. The right of the individual prophet is to persuade the king, and he has no legal right. He has a moral right to call the king back to the right way, the way of Yahweh, and to, and to the, call the people from abandoning their god and going to the city gods. The people responded to the prophets, and constituted authority would not touch them. 
Now there's a new rise of empires, okay? The, the Hebrew kingdom lasted only 200 years. From 900 to 612 BC, the Neo-Assyrians arose and conquered the area. From 744 to 705 BC, they conquered Palestine. Let's see if I have these dates here. From 586 to 539 BC, the Hebrews were taken into the Babylonian captivity uh, under the Chaldeans, which are another group of Indo-Europeans that conquered that area. From 540 to 322 BC, the Persians conquered. They were kinder rulers, but they were still rulers, and the Persians took over and ruled the, um, the um, Hebrew state. Okay, and so what is the experience of these people? Okay, here we have the Assyrian Empire overwhelming the Holy Land. Here we have the, the Median and Chaldean Empires over, overrunning the Holy Land. And here we have the Persian Empire overrunning the Holy Land and Egypt as well in Asia Minor. Okay. Uh, here's Sennacherib, king of the Assyrians, receiving captive Hebrew, Hebrews. Remember, they were ripped out of their country, and they remember how the Assyrians ruled. They ripped people up, and they moved them to another place to make them abandon their god. And the Assyrians ripped up the Hebrews and took them out, uh, took them out and, and, and took them to um, Mesopotamia. Here are the Hebrews paying tribute to the king of Assyria. And here is an Aramaic letter written by a Hebrew community in Egypt to the Persian government, governor of Palestine in the 5th century BC. This period of the prophets was just as formative from 900 to 322 BC under all these different new empires. Okay, during this time, the Mesopotamian stories were adopted. Um, this, is, this is the time when the Tower of Babel is written into the Bible. You remember the story about the Tower of Babel, uh, which the Hebrews condemned the people of Babel who were building a huge tower to climb up and to reach God, and, um, and God destroyed their tower and destroyed all the people and made them speak different languages. Okay, the Tower of Babel was a ziggurat. Okay, they also uh, developed, uh, adopted the story of the flood. Okay, and this is one of the readings that we have, the story of the Hebrew story of the flood in the Bible that uh, we can compare. In a moment, we will compare it to the flood in Gilgamesh. The Hebrews also adopted elements of Zoroastrianism. For example, this is when they have elements of the elements of heaven and hell and the devil. And the devil is Zoroastrian. It's a Zoroastrian god they get from the Persians. But these concepts are interpreted differently. When the Hebrews adopt these concepts from other people, they interpret them quite differently. Um, First of all, the Hebrews assume that there's an intelligence behind creation. Uh, but note, the there is intelligence in the Enuma Elish. Ea is a god of wisdom, and the Egyptian Atum is a god of wisdom. But the Hebrews may put more emphasis on it, that there's intelligence behind the creation. And the other idea of the, of the Hebrews that's different is that the world was created for humans and not gods. God created the world for human beings and for the benefit of human beings. Compare, for example, the two versions of the flood. How do you com compare the two different versions of the flood? Remember the the, the two uh, actors. Utnapishtim is the is the flood in Gilgamesh. He's the one who was saved by one of his gods, uh, so that he survived the flood. And then Noah is the is the um, uh, boat captain in in Genesis that uh, is saved by the flood. How do you compare those two versions of the flood? Yeah. Noah's account is very humanistic. It's not. It doesn't have a lot of mythology in it. In fact, like you know, Noah doesn't see the God. He, you know, he 
I mean, he hears the voice of God, but Ishna pushed him like, you know, he's in touch with God and almost in, in person. Yeah, he's almost in person with the God. Well, what about what about the whole concept? What it, what is the reason that the flood is sent in the Gilgamesh epic? Why do the gods send the flood? Because humans are making a lot of noise, and the flood in um, I mean Noah's uh, time happens because uh, the people have. Um, The people have sinned. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, what is different about those two accounts? Yeah. The, uh, the biblical account, the, pe the people abandoned is when the, the abandonment of Yahweh. They, they were had to pretty much abandoned Yahweh. So he they abandoned them. their God. He, yeah, yeah. He punished them by sending the flood. So. And in Gilgamesh, it's because they make they're just making the gods angry because they're making a lot of noise. And they're okay, they're, they're just bothersome like an anthill, you know, just wipe them out because they're making too much noise. And but, also in Gilgamesh, yeah. you know, the god regrets, you know, you know, one god, you know, mm -hmm. he's like, what have I done? Because, you know, he's not invited, but uh, in Noah's, you know, God's like, okay, I did this, I know what I'm doing, and, you know, we're going to have seeds come out of this, but, you know, in Gilgamesh, there's nothing like that. Everyone, all the other gods are rejoicing, you know, when he um, sends out the sweet smell and there's only one god that comes out and says, what have I done? Yeah, there's only one god who tries to save uh, Nepishtim. Well, well, there's a difference. There are a lot of gods in, in Gilgamesh and there's only one god in, in um, the story of Noah in the Hebrew story. Hebrew version of that story, um, but but what about the people? Do they deserve the flood? They don't deserve the flood in 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 Gilgamesh. They're they're just the gods are just petty, you know, for a silly reason. They're destroying human beings. They're heartless and cruel, and and petty. Whereas God, when He sends the flood, He's punishing the people for abandoning God because they've sinned. They and they're sinful. So we have this concept of sin that God is just, okay? In the Gilgamesh story, the gods are not just. There's no question of justice at all. But in, in Noah's story, God is just because he's punishing the people because they deserve it, because they have sinned. Okay, so there's a concept of justice. Yeah, do you have a comment? Both stories are essentially the people's way of explaining natural geological phenomenon that they couldn't explain otherwise as well. Yes, right. exactly, exactly. And there probably was a flood. I mean, there's been a lot of archaeological work. There probably was a great flood. It probably wasn't the whole world, but it was probably the whole, you know, Near, Near Eastern world, a large part of it. But how did they explain it? Okay, the Jews, the, the Hebrews explain it by saying that they have sinned and displeased their God and their God is a just God and he is punishing them because they deserve it and not because they're bothersome. And, 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 and it's, it's, a, it's a higher concept. So, the, so we know the story of Gilgamesh pre-existed and so what they're doing is changing that story to make it ethical and this is the creation of ethical monotheism, okay? Um, even so, in, in this context, well, Adnapishtim becomes immortal and, and Noah founds a, a new um, society of, of people on, er, on earth who are loyal to Yahweh. But even so, in the ancient context, Yahweh was the God who did wrong, okay? If you were an Egyptian, if you were a Sumerian or a Babylonian, why would you look at Yahweh as the God who did wrong? Okay, why is Yahweh the God who did wrong? What did he do wrong? What did the ancient Near East expect from a God? What did the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians expect a God to do? Any God, not just one God, but lots of gods. Would press your mic, yeah. Reward them and get reward them. Reward them for their worship. Okay. What else do they expect? Yeah. 
Well, they were supposed to protect their people, and this god had left them into a land of milk and honey that wasn't very prosperous, and also put them in a place where they were going to be attacked by a bunch of enemies. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, you, you expect your God to reward you. You expect your God to, to protect you. You expect your God to make you rich and powerful and a, maybe a conqueror of lots of people. That's what gods are for, right? And if you, if you please your God, he will let you do that. And here we have these Hebrews just bowing and scraping and adoring their God and, and doing everything for their God. And what did Yahweh give to the Hebrews? The land of milk and honey, as you mentioned, which was really very barren and very, very unfruitful, not a very nice land. What else did their God do to them? Did he protect them? Go ahead. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, there's, they've taken over by all of these different classes of people, and they're subjected to, I mean, they're put upon basically throughout history. Exactly. They're conquered over and over and over again. They're ripped out of the country and taken to Egypt as slaves, and then they're ripped out again and taken to Assyria as slaves. What kind of a god is that? What good is he doing them? And they're so faithful to him. And, and they try so hard. And here is this God doing everything wrong. This is the God who did wrong, didn't protect them. They're poor, they're shepherds, they're slaves. You know, and what kind of a God is that? Why not just get rid of him? Wouldn't you get rid of that kind of a God who gave you, gave you slavery and gave you poverty and gave you conquest all the time? Is it because they have such a strong notion of fear that they even fear letting go of him? Yeah. Well, they stay loyal to their God, okay, uh, and the Hebrews from their expo historical experience got disaster after disaster, but instead of getting rid of their God, what the Hebrews did was change their concept of him. What they did was say, we are not serving God rightly. Whatever we're doing, God is punishing us because we have done something wrong. We have failed our God or he wouldn't do this to us. And even though they tried really hard, they, what they invented was the concept of sin, that they had sinned. And then they developed another interesting concept that when God was punishing them by letting all these people conquer them and take them into slavery and, and letting them live poor, um, slavish lives in a terrible land that God was educating them that every time God did something like that to them he was punishing them not just to torture them but to teach them something about the right way to live so that they were learning through their experience and this is why they wrote down the Bible because it's the record of, their, uh, of each time something happened to them, it was God teaching them the right way to live. It's an education of the right way to live. And so this is why they wrote down the Bible. God was educating them through experience and their, the history of their experience was the history of their education. Okay, and that's it. And so the Bible is a book of history telling the experience of the Jews and all the lessons God is teaching them one at a time. And, and to look at that, the book of Job is a microcosm reflecting that macrocosm. The book of Job reflects what, uh, what God was teaching them in, in the Bible. And let me read a little bit of this to you. I'll, I, I won't read the whole thing, but a bit of it. This is selections from the book of Job which is on our website um, so that you can, you can print this out. I hope some of you have read it already. So here's the synopsis of the story so far. Job is an upright and pious man, and he's been struck by a series of disasters which have destroyed his family, his great wealth, and finally his health, leaving him only his shrewish wife. 
In a society where God rewarded the just and punished the evil, Job's suffering presented a terrible problem. Okay, here is the God who did wrong. Job was a good man and he was a righteous man and look at all these bad things that happened to him. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place. Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the, the Namathite, and they made an appointment together to come to bemoan him and to comfort him. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust upon their heads uh, as in mourning for what happened to Job. Okay, here is Job lying on a dung heap in poverty, losing all his children, his health, his wealth, and all he has is his shrewish wife. Okay. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed his mouth and cursed his day. And Job answered and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night which said that there is a man-child conceived, let that day be darkness. So here is he mourning. He's saying, Oh, why was I ever born? I wish I was dead. Okay, and then he goes on like that for, for lines and lines. Then answered Eliphaz the Temanite and said, if one would try to, commute, to communicate with you, will you be grieved? Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent. Okay, here you've had this punishment from God. Where were the upright cut off? They that plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the breath of God they perish. And so what he's saying is, you must have done something bad because God is punishing you. You must have done something evil. Then Job answered and said, Teach me and I will hold my peace and cause me to understand where I have erred. I have done nothing wrong. And you have to start with the premise, premise that Job is a righteous man and he has done nothing wrong. And here he has all this unjust punishment. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, how long will you speak these things? And how long shall the words of your mouth be like a mighty wind? Does God prefer justice? Does the Almighty God pervert righteousness? Behold, God will not cast away a perfect man, neither will he uphold evildoers. God is just. He, if God is punishing you, then you've done something wrong. Then answered Job and said, But how can man be just with God? For he is not a man, as I am, that I should answer him. Let him take his rod away from me, and let not his terror make me afraid. Then would I speak and not fear him, for I am not so in myself. God is so great, and I am so small, and God is not a man. Um, uh, I, sh I want to speak to God. Then answered Zopar the Mathamite, and said, Should thy boastings make men hold their peace? And when you mock, mock, shall no man make you ashamed? For you say, my doctrine is pure, and I am clean in, in your eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee. Okay, so Job is saying, I want to speak to God. I want God to answer. Why has he done these bad things to me when I'm a good man? Then Job answered and said, No doubt, but you are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am a good man. The just and perfect man is a laughing stock. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. Okay. And then he he mulls around and he he mulls this over and he thinks about this and he says, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, wax mighty in power? Why do the wicked and the evil prosper in the world? I've seen that they prosper. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them. And they say unto God, Depart from us. And yet the wicked prosper. Why does that happen? The counsel of the wicked is far from me. I'm not wicked. I'm good. Surely my lips shall not speak unrighteousness, neither shall my tongue utter deceit. My righteousness I hold fast and will not let it go. My heart shall not reproach me as long as I live. Let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine in integrity. Okay. Then Jehovah answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel? Who is this little insignificant person 
who speaks words without knowledge about me, great God. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who determined the measure thereof, if you know, or who stretched out the line upon it? And he goes on and on in that vein. Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whoever is under the whole heaven is mine. And so God then says how, how great he is and, and he is so far above Job. How can this insignificant person ever question the way of God's? Who hath first given unto me that I should repay him? Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Then Job answered Jehovah and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be restrained. Therefore have I uttered that which I understand not, things too wonderful for me which I know not. Therefore I hate myself and repent in dust and ashes. Okay. What are the questions that Job is asking? What are the questions that Job is asking in this little story? Yes. I think the ultimate question would be, why should you be a moral and righteous person if there's still the possibility of you just being punished? Exactly. And to phrase that another way, where is justice? Where is justice? I mean, I'm a good man and God is still punishing me. Where is justice? Is God a just man? And then what's another question that he's asking? Uh, there, there are a number of questions in this story that he's asking. Any other questions that you can discern in the story? Okay, how about, and this is part of your comment, why should I do good? If the evil prosper and the good are punished, then why should I do good? You know, what is the point of doing good? And then another question that he's asking in this story is, where does evil come from? Okay, if I'm a really good man and I'm so devoted to God and I do everything right and look what God has done to me, he's punishing me even though I was good, this is evil evil things are happening to me. So where does evil come from? Where does evil come from? Okay, those are the questions he's asking. Now, what are the answers? I gave you the answers in reading you this little story. Okay. What are the answers? Where is justice? The good are being punished. The good suffer. Good people suffer. Where is justice? Yeah. I guess the answer is basically that's not for you to know, that's for God to know. Exactly. We are, so, we are so small and God is so great that we cannot understand God's justice. What appears it unjust to us may be part of God's larger purpose because he's so great that we can't understand him. He is so great we can't understand him. There's an enormous gulf between God and man, and man can't fathom the ways of God because God is so great. Any other answers that you can discern in this story? Okay. What about evil? Why is there evil in the world? Why is there evil? Okay, it has something to do with God wanting evil. It's not that God wants to do evil to us, but evil is part of God's plan, that there is evil and we have to accept it. Bad things happen to good people. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's because God has some larger plan and we just can't understand it, you know? And it's, it's, it may seem evil to us, but God has reasons for everything he does. We cannot know God's plan or God's justice. We just simply are not great enough to understand God's plan and we must accept it. What appears to be evil may be good in God's overall plan. So this story of Job, it's kind of like a microcosm and it's a mirror image of what happened to the Hebrews. Okay, the Hebrews were good. They, they loved God and they worshiped God. And what happened to them? 
They got conquered over and over again. They got enslaved. They got punished. They were poor when everybody else was rich. And, and the, the evil prospered. Their conquerors got rich and enslaved them. And, and their conquerors weren't good. They were evil people. So why do the evil prosper? And so this is the answer they came up with. Remember that we started when we talked about monotheism being a really difficult, a really difficult concept to understand. That, that if you have good and evil, light and dark, um, black and white, all these opposites coming from the same source, from one God, how do you explain that? Okay, I'm, I'm getting behind on this. Okay. Uh, well, here, here we have all this conquering again. So that is how they, that is how they explained it. Uh, with the story of Job, we have a kind of microcosm of their whole experience. Here is the Egyptian Empire, where they were conquered by the Egyptians. Here is the Assyrian Empire. They are conquered by the Assyrians. Here's the Persian Empire, the, the Median and Chaldean Empires. They're conquered by first, who are also Indo-Europeans. And then the Persians conquer the whole place. And, and the Hebrews are conquered over and over again. They're swallowed up in a big world they cannot understand. OK. So the book of Job is a microcosm reflecting the macrocosm. And here are the questions that Job is asking. Where is justice? Why should I do good? From whence does evil come? All right. So divine ways are beyond human understanding. And Job makes monotheism. This is how monotheism is understood. Um, God does, isn't punishing us. God is just working out a plan, and it is too great for us to understand. And it may seem evil to us, but it isn't. And God is just, after all. OK. Divine ways are beyond human understanding. What appears to be evil may be good in God's overall plan. OK. Why did monotheism succeed? Remember we said, that it's a difficult and demanding idea. It's very difficult to understand monotheism. Why did it succeed? Because the idea gradually evolved from the experience of the people. Okay. The consequences are that the individual conscious is now supreme over the priests. Um, because the prophets arose to explain that people must be loyal to God, must stay with their God, even though bad things happen to them or things change, the individual conscience now takes supremacy over the priests in the idea. There's a new idea of history. The people are learning through defeat. and their experience is worth writing down, creating a history of their experience because it's the history of God's teaching them. The people are learning through their history and their experience. A further correlation is that God acts through history. God educates through history and reveals himself through history, revealing his lessons. So the Bible, then, is a history, a record of God's teaching. This is why the Bible was written down. And it's a major departure. Think about this for a minute. How is this different from how the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians perceive reality? OK, perceive reality. That's a kind of difficult and complicated question. Okay, how, is, how is this concept different that God acts through history and, and that you write history down? What is history anyway? What is history? It's a story that has a beginning with the creation 
and it continues through time with all the lessons of God and presumably it has an end someday when people reach perfection that God has taught them everything. Yeah. Well, how is that different? Well, history, like for the Jewish, um, it was a timeline yes. of events, whereas for like the Egyptians and the people in Mesopotamia, it was just a cycle, an endless cycle of events. Good. Good, yes, the Egyptians think of the year, the cycle going over and over and over again, the cycle of the year repeating itself endlessly with the seasons of the year and the growing of the crops and all of that. The Mesopotamians are the same way, the cycle of the new year over and over again, the cyclical. So, so why, why is this important? Why is this different thought so important that the, that the Hebrews can conceive of a linear kind of history, a linear history. Because you can see progress? Yes, you can see progress. You can conceive of getting better and better, moving towards some goal, and God's goal is educating them so that someday they will be better. And so this is a really different concept. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier how, how pre history man that had no concept of past and future so it's a natural evolution that right. the Hebrews devise a system of past and future beginning and end. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and prehistorical men had no concept of the past and no concept of the future, but everything is always this endless present. And, and there's a certain degree of that in Egypt and Mesopotamia as well because of this secular, cyclical history that they think of, that tomorrow is going to be like the same day last year uh, in that date in the calendar, that, that experience repeats itself over and over again, okay? And you don't, you don't have a particular goal to work toward. You can't think of the future as being different from the, the endless repeating of the patterns, okay? You think of, reality as a pattern that repeats itself over and over again, whereas with linear history, you have a beginning and you have an end, and you proceed toward, you, could, you, you have progress, which is exactly what you said. You can move from one state to another and things can change. You have a concept of change and things becoming different and developing something different. This is really important to have that kind of a concept. Uh, um, and the record is of God's teaching so that the Hebrews are learning and they're progressing and they're getting better and better and they're learning more from God and they're learning more about God. God is revealing himself gradually through this history. This is why the Bible is written down. This is why they wrote it down so that they could have a record of what God taught them and they could learn from that record again from seeing it again and again. So this is our idea of history, that history is linear and it's a particularly um, Middle Eastern and European idea it later spreads to Christianity and it spreads to Europe, but it doesn't exist in any other culture. I mean, this is something new that only exists within the Middle Eastern line of culture as it goes in the Middle East and to Europe. Islam shares it and uh, Christianity shares it and ultimately Europe shares it but it allows you have to have an idea of progress, and so that's very important. Um, that's the key. Okay, I was very fast today. <laughs> See? Any questions? We have a few minutes for questions. I have a yeah. question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little freaked out about the maps. I don't feel like I'm seeing them long enough to really be able to talk about them on a test. Um, do I just pick that up from the website and study them from there, or are we going to actually get a handout of a map? Okay, you're going to get a blank map to study with. Uh, we'll be loading it on the website. There'll be a blank map to study with. 
Um, your textbook has maps in it, and so uh, all of the, I mean, these aren't the precise maps that are in your textbooks. I make these maps to illustrate specific points, but there are maps in your textbook that show uh, all, where all these places are and where these empires are. And so, you, you know, I'm showing you scores of maps. I can't possibly give you all of the maps. Uh, so you, the point is so that you need to learn to recognize these places. And, and um, that's one reason I show them to you over and over again, so you can see where these places are. But look in your textbook. There are good maps in your textbook, and you can locate all of these places. Are you going to expect, like, my you want to pressure mic? Yeah. Are you going to expect like minute details, like the you know the city of Ur and the river in Ur? I mean, that specific, or is it just uh, not necessarily that specific? Um, when on the test, when I give you a blank map, what we're going to do is to have um, we might have a, a dot where a city is, or we might lay, uh, and put a number by it, and we or we might have a number by a river. Or we might have a number by a mountain or by a sea. Uh, and what I want you to do is to, to um, identify what that place is and then write a short essay. It's only like a third of a page in your blue book. Why that place is significant. Okay. So what if, for example, could I go back to some of these maps? What if, for example, uh, where it says um, Asia Minor, you, it doesn't say Asia Minor, but you recognize Asia Minor on this map. Do you, do you recognize it? OK, this is where the Hittite Empire was, right? OK, so far. Uh, and, and the Persians ruled it. And um, uh, well, later on, more things will happen to it. But, but right now, if you were to have the test right now, you would say that's where the Hittite Empire was. And why is this significant? Because it's the first Indo-European empire, and it's the first step of the Indo-Europeans into the Middle Eastern region. Okay so that you need to identify what it is. It's Asia Minor. It's where the Hittite Empire was. It is, uh, it is the first incursion of the Indo-Europeans and the first phase of the Indo-European invasions. And why are the Indo-European Indo invasions important? Because they changed the whole situation of the ancient Near East. I mean, they utterly transformed it, those invasions. OK, that's the kind of thing you need to say. What if I had a number by the Nile River? OK, there, it's part of the Persian Empire. <laughs> what if I had a number by the Nile River? How would you answer that question? You want to press your mic? The livelihood of the people of the Egyptian Empire, it sustained them and Yes, exactly. You would say you would say this is the Nile River, and you would say it is the foundation and the basis of the whole Egyptian culture, because the whole Egyptian culture is based on that river and and the life giving uh, water that it gives to them and the and the the fluctuations of it for the seasons. You would talk about the flow of the river, uh, the, the flow of the river going northward to the sea and the winds blowing to the south, uh, giving it two-way transportation. OK, so, so the significance of the Nile River, and, and you want to give more details than just one sentence. I mean, you want to talk about the life-givingness and, and how it emphasized the Egyptian culture, because it's a very, very tame river that doesn't flood and, and destroy them, and so it, it influenced their religion and made their gods kind and loving because their, the river was kind and loving. And, and so you want to you know, expand and talk about as many significances as you can in a, a, a third or a, or a half a page. Um, so that would be the significance of the Nile River. The main significance is it gives life to the whole Egyptian culture and it influences in, in religious ways. It, it, it makes them prosperous. It, uh, it um, 
allows their culture to grow, it protects them, it, it uh, uh, shaped the way they thought about their gods and their religion, and so all those things you could say about the Nile River. So this is the way we're going to ask questions on the, on the, on the exam about the maps. Okay, and so when I show you these maps, I mean, you look at them, look at them and, and see where things are. And, and so you can see this is the Persian Empire. We can go back to the Chaldean and Median empires. I didn't talk too much about them, but they were, um, uh, they were precursors to the Persian Empire. The Medes and the Chaldeans were Indo-European people that were related to the Persians. Okay, and, and then here's another precursor, the Assyrian Empire that unifies, um, unifies the Mesopotamian River Valley with, uh, with the Holy Land, or later it would be called the Holy Land. But, so you can see where all these places are. Uh, um, does that answer your question on how we're going to do that? So now we're just, we're just really looking at Egypt and Mesopotamia and Asia Minor, and now we have Persia or Iran into the picture. Um, we're expanding, we're constantly expanding as we go on. Well, next week we're going to look at China and India. Okay, we're going to look at new civilizations. I think we're doing India first because the Indo Europeans went there. And then we're going to look at the cradle of civilization in China, which is another cradle of, of civilization. You have an awful lot of readings for next week on India and China. So try to get through as many as you can. And I'll mention as many as I can in the lecture. OK. So we'll move eastward and see some other centers of culture. OK, see you next week.